And now I think I'm good to go. How do I sound? Sound good? Yes? Yeah. No? Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I think we have all three, three things going on right now. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, what's up, you guys? Well, praise the Lord. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Christian Way Ministries. Welcome to week seven, uh, teaching intentional discipleship in an age of moral relativism, where we're learning how to be true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially in our day and age and culture and context today. So you guys made it, you guys made it. We are one week to go before the end of the course. So we're already thinking ahead. Imagine when we first started in week one, we were like, oh, seems like a long journey, right? But now look at us, week seven, and we're about to be week eight, and here we are. We're going to be issuing your certificates, and we're praying that the charge of the Great Commission will be encouraged and that we will apply it and put it into practice. So we're just so thankful. We're so blessed. So without further ado, I have lots to get uh, through today. So let's start with a small prayer. You ready? <laughs> Father God, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for your grace and your holiness. We thank you, Lord, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, Lord, and, and that he showed us the way how to be true disciples and followers of him. So God, we pray right now in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit will have his way, that you will open our hearts and our minds to receive today's lesson on what it really means to be true followers of your son, Jesus Christ, in the world that we live in today. We pray that your word will enlighten us, Lord, and how we can go about exercising the Great Commission, how we can go about following the Lord Jesus Christ, and how we can share and proclaim the gospel in our context today. So God, I just pray that you will be with us, that you will anoint this session. We rebuke the evil one right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, those that wanted to attend this course this evening, whether in person or online, and were unable to, Lord, we just pray especially special blessing over them, God, that you will protect them and that they will be able to receive this message later on. I pray for all of those, Lord, who have been faithful throughout this eight-week journey, God, that you will continue to prepare them, uh, that you will continue to activate them and encourage them to fight the good fight for the faith. So, God, I thank you for each and every one of them. Continue to provide for all of our needs according to your riches and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome again, everyone. Welcome again to week session, uh, week uh, seven of teaching intentional discipleship in an age of moral relativism. Uh, just a few announcements. Again, uh, we only have one more week left. March 16th uh, concludes this course. And Tiffany, I'm going to have a need for you on Tuesday to kind of do some refreshments so we can celebrate uh, the end of this course here. Uh, but just the new beginning of, yeah, no days off for Tiff. Uh, Tiff, I, I really pray for Tiff because she has a lot of functions that she's participating and helping us out with this month. Uh, so next week is our last course. So not only will you get your certificates, but you will also receive a post questionnaire that needs to be filled out prior to you leaving here we'll email that to you all right and so also what i need is this uh clipboard to go around with your name how you want your name spelled on a certificate with your email address for those that uh haven't been able to take all of the courses if you still want to receive a certificate of attendance you have to go back and look at all the courses previously that we've done and say i watched all of them and i attended these so you can receive that certificate of attendance okay and for those that are online if you will please in the group chat put your name uh, how you want it spelled on a certificate and also uh, supply your email address so we can issue out those certificates via email to you. Uh, that is so important so we can get that, um, that certificate to you, okay? So please put it in the chat or email us your name and uh, whatever, you know, just the exact spelling of your name so we can get it right. Uh, other than that, 
Don't forget our post questionnaire will be emailed by the end of the course next week, which will have its own. It's going to be short. So it, it shouldn't take nothing but 10, maybe 15 minutes the longest. It's not like the pre questionnaire that had almost 40 questions on it. And then this course is completely voluntary and will be recorded for the purposes of research and for those courses that you want to look back or you want to share with others. You can find it at www.roadtothecross.org slash misconceptions clarify. Are we good to go? Are you guys ready? You guys ready for week seven? I'm ready to teach it. I'm ready to teach it. So here we go. Here we go. What we reviewed last week. This is what we did last week. Last week, we reviewed the meaning of the church and its ultimate purpose. We outlined the meaning of the Great Commission and its core essentials. We reviewed the meaning of disciple and discipleship, and we covered the fundamental components of how to truly be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what we did last week. And that was a whole 62 slides worth of information that we pushed out to you. So what to expect this week? This week, let me move this thing up here a little bit so it's out of the way. This week, we're gonna reiterate the purpose of the church we're going to reiterate the meaning of the Great Commission and discipleship. As my brother Dennis said before, repetition matters. So there will be some things that we will constantly repeat to you guys so we can retain this information in our hearts and in the back of our minds. So repetition is key when it comes to the fundamentals of our faith and what it means to be a disciple. We're going to outline the Great Commission essentials with an emphasis on go, make, and proclaim. All right, we're going to reiterate what it means to be a disciple and review the marks of a true disciple. We will define what to proclaim the gospel. We're going to describe the elements in the gospel, and we're going to explain three ways for believers to proclaim the gospel. Today's teaching will continue to expound on the purpose of the church, the meaning of the Great Commission, the meaning of discipleship, the meaning of a disciple, outline the marks of a true disciple, and explain what it means to go and make disciples according to the charge of the Great Commission. That's what to expect this week. Yes. Are you guys excited? Okay, remove all of your yawns out of the way. Go ahead, yawn now. Go ahead, get all the yawns out the way now, okay? <laughs> get them all out the way now. And so what did I do wrong this time last week? As you guys know, I'm always striving for perfection and striving to improve on what I taught the week before. So as you know, we're not perfect, but we strive for it. And when we make errors or we make minor mistakes, we correct them, okay? We own up to it. We take responsibility and accountability and say, I was wrong. Now I know for us females, uh, some of the fear is hard to do that at times. I know I'm coming for y'all today, uh, but also the men too. It's hard for the men to swallow their pride and own up to whatever mistakes that they make. So as the pastor, I have to lead by example, okay, and say that I was wrong on this one thing. And last week I was talking about the fundamentals of interpreting scripture and how the scriptures was written within a, a span of 1500 years with the latest letter, the, the, the letter to uh, the letter of Revelation, the epistle to, to Revelation, the book of Revelation, okay, was written, I said 100 BC last week, I meant 100 AD, okay, that was the, the, the latest date that they subscribed to the book of Revelation. So excuse me for that small error there, 100 AD. Yeah, yeah, it's right there. I meant 100 AD, huh? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, she's pointing out other small <laughs> grammatical errors. Okay, again, excuse me for the grammatical errors up here. They're supposed to be most. But you know what? I love that the, the saints pay attention to detail. That's very good. You're awake. Let's see if you pay attention while we get closer to the end of the course. See if you can still spot out these small grammatical. So, yes, there will be some here and there. Uh, sometimes I just go so fast I miss some of the uh, spelling on the slides itself. But warning, warning, most, most of the information given in this course is really only scratching the surface. 
It really is. Especially when we were talking about the historical formulations, all of the philosophies, you know, what it really means to be a disciple and examining the gospel accounts. Again, we have 66 books. We have 5,000 years worth of recorded history. Okay, and I'm trying to break down how we arrive to our secular day and age today in a span of a few hours. Very difficult to do. So we're really just scratching the surface on some of these topics, but I pray that it encourages you and that it will increase your knowledge and make you aware of some things that maybe you weren't aware of before. Amen. And so again, discipleship, discipleship, discipleship. We're going to continue to reiterate that. Okay. And the reason why we're going through what we're going through today is because we are lacking in the department of discipleship. And this is exactly why we need to get back to the fundamentals of teaching, okay, intentional, meaning making it a priority, being intentional with discipleship in order to persevere under this post postmodern era, which is the era that we're in in our culture today, where it's not even about reason or wisdom anymore. It's all about feelings and emotions and experience. And that becomes our truth and our reality. So it's no longer about the absolute truth of God's word. It's all about the relative truth of our experience and our emotions and how we're feeling, okay? Um, so this is why we need to get back to intentional discipleship to learn how to be true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and to contest the never-ending cultural shifts and false doctrines with the absolute truth of God's word. And so today I have just a few resources that I want to bring to your attention. I hope you're still reading your complete guide on the book of discipleship. Very great information here. So continue to read that. Um, I have this thing here. It's a really big book, but it's a great resource tool. It's called Evangelical Dictionary of Theology. Praise the Lord. If you really want to get into the nitty gritty about some theological doctrines, you want to know what the gospel is, what the Great Commission is, what Christianity is, what discipleship is. I mean, every term related to the faith or anything that has disagreement with our faith, you can pretty much find it in this dictionary right here. So I quote this dictionary quite often in my research because you need credible and when it comes to research youtube is not credible research facebook is not credible research twitter gospel is not credible research it's not okay we're talking about right here academic scholarly sources that you can cite and reference okay that contributes to your knowledge increases your knowledge for my university for my doctorate i cannot quote twitter i cannot quote youtube i cannot quote facebook i cannot quote feelings okay i cannot quote opinions i have to quote credible academic sources and how can you tell a, a, a source, say for instance, you go on the internet and you're looking up a particular you know, word or you're looking up some information, how can you tell whether or not that information is credible? Well, whether or not you go to the bottom of the page and they cite where they got their information from. We all get our information from somewhere. So what are they citing? Where are they getting their information from? If you go to Wikipedia, and that's not a source that we can quote, but at least on Wikipedia, you scroll all the way down, they have all of the references to where they got their information from. So that's so key when it comes to doing any kind of credible research. Uh, then this book here, The Great Commission Obedience by Jerry Rackin. Uh, this is a great source that I'm going to be quoting from today. So if you really want to know more about what it means, to exercise the Great Commission. This is another good source. Uh, my man, I don't have this written down here, but Peter Burfine, I went to chaplain school with him and he talks about Gnostic America. Remember the secret knowledge, the deeper knowledge uh, that, that's, that it's, it's, it's obtaining a special knowledge that's how we attain salvation, that's Gnosticism. Well, he talks about how America became really Gnostic and it's just, in, in its culture today. So this is a really good book, really academic. I actually went to school with him. And then obviously we're gonna be talking about proclaiming the gospel and this book here by David Fiorato, The Cost of Our Silence. So the enemy wants to silence your voice, okay? Cause he understands that one of the essentials of the great commission is the proclamation of the gospel. 
So he's trying to silence believers today. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that. All in a nutshell. Remember that slide in a nutshell? Well, basically everything that I'm doing, it's all in a nutshell. Praise the Lord. It's all in a nutshell. It may seem like it's not, but it is. It really is. And the purpose of the church. Remember the purpose of the church. Y'all remember that, right? What's the purpose of the church? What's the purpose of the church? Make disciples. Absolutely. To fulfill what? The Great Commission. I mean, that's essentially the mission of the church is the charge of the Great Commission to go ye therefore and make disciples, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything Moses commanded. No, what Jesus commanded according to the scriptures. So the primary purpose and mission of the church is to carry out the Great commission that is the mission that is the purpose of the church we are we are responsible as a body of christ not about the four walls it's about the body of christ coming together for the same common cause of the great commission to make disciples and everything about the church and what it does its disciples its programs its ministry its outreach must be centered around that core fundamental aspect of our faith which is to make disciples okay and what does the great commission mean what does it mean according to the journal of theology the great commission is a divine mandate which is the which is the profoundest law of the church's being and pentecost is the effectuation of that mandate meaning the meaning the day of pentecost is what allowed that to move forward Okay, without the day of Pentecost, the disciples were not able to leave from Jerusalem to go be witnesses to all the nations. The Great Commission is the mandate to the church to witness and to witness universally. At Pentecost, this mandate became an organic part of the church's being, an essential expression of her life. This is all about us, the church, doing what God has commanded us to do the Great Commission. Praise the Lord. Again, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. And nations in the Greek, ethnos, ethnicities. So go to all ethnicities okay and baptize them in the name of the father son and of the holy spirit and teaching them to obey everything i have commanded and jesus gives the disciples this promise and surely i am with you always to the very end of the age so we talked about last week the five great commission essentials go you're gonna talk about go that two letter word short but powerful make that short four-letter word, short but powerful, proclaim, baptize, and teach. So today we're really going to tackle the first three, and the last two we'll leave for next week. And before we went into the Great Commission Essentials, we had to break down what discipleship is and what it means to be a disciple. So discipleship, although the term is not specifically mentioned in the Bible, is the process of following Jesus. It's that simple in a nutshell, okay? Discipleship is the state of being a disciple. We are always in the condition of being disciples, loving Christ and obeying our masters. There are no days off for disciples, okay? Okay, you know, like on your jobs, you get the weekend off or, or you get four to five weeks of vacation. I know some of us in here probably get about six weeks of vacation. But you got to have one of them kind of up there, upper echelon kind of a job. I'm not going to call any saints out in the room today. Um, but, you you know, uh, but, 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 but with disciples, we don't get no vacation. There was a question last week. I think Minister Vanderpool uh, mentioned this question. Uh, uh, how do pastors retire? <laughs> how do disciples retire? The only time you retire is when the Lord says, well done, my good and faithful servant. I have fought the good fight. I had right, and this is right before Paul would get ultimately, according to the sources, would, would be beheaded for the faith. But if it wasn't that he got beheaded or martyred for the cause, he would have continued on what? Preaching the gospel free of charge. That was his duty. And so until the Lord calls us to glory, there's no such thing as vacation. 
Okay, the, the, the statement says we are always in the condition of being disciples 24 7, 365, 366 on elite year. Okay, so whatever the devil says, hey, you can take today off, that's the time to rebuke him, to resist him, so he can flee from you, okay? And don't, don't, don't think and say, well, you know, today I'm gonna get a little wild and get drunk. No, that's not what disciples do. And we're gonna talk about all the marks of the disciples here in a minute, all right? Let's go here. And so before we can go and make disciples again, we have to learn how to be one how to be a disciple. And so what is a disciple? Well, according to the Greek language, it means to follow as a disciple, to train in discipleship and to be disciplined and instructed. Literally, disciple means learner. So we're a learner. We're a student for life. We're always striving for perfection. There is never a point as a disciple, I don't care how old you are, You'd be 85, 95, 105, where we cannot continue to learn from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right? So it is a learner. Disciples think and learn, but they also move beyond learning to doing the endeavor. So, so for, our, for us Christians, for disciples, it has to move beyond our mental cognitive ability. It has to move beyond into our actions. It has to bleed through our deeds. We can't just be Christians by thought and not by deed. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. Actionable faith. Whoever would believe in him. Okay, now believe is action. Pisteo, meaning to do, to act. So you can't just believe in your mind. You have to believe in your actions. So a lot of people just think, well, the Bible says all I got to do is believe. No, that's scratching the surface in the English language. Believe, according to the original language, meant accompanied by action. Amen? Amen? Five components to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And this is just in a nutshell. We're going to crunch all of the marks of a disciple under these five essential components. Repentance. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, did you repent today? <laughs> if you said no, you know what you need to do when you get home later. Okay. Okay. Confess whatever the Holy Spirit convicts on your mind or your heart or what you need to confess and get better. Obe obey. Obey. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. All right. So you got repentance. Yeah. Huh. You got following. I know. And you see, every time we talk about repentance, it just causes a stir in the atmosphere. Following, holiness, suffering, and obviously we have to be missionally minded. Missions. Missions has to be part of what a disciple is. Hey, all of this goes hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. You got to do all of them. You got to do all of them. And if I had to sum up all of the marks of what it means to be a disciple, it's summed up in one word. Following. Following Jesus following how he lived, how he spoke, how he responded to his day, uh, to his culture and to the various opponents he encountered in his life, mimicking every aspect of Jesus's life. That's what it really means to follow, to follow as a disciple, to imitate. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And when we look at Matthew, in the beginning of Matthew's gospel in chapter four, when he spoke to Peter and Andrew, one of the first disciples that Jesus calls, he says this, come follow me, Jesus says, and I will send you out to fish for people. And look at their response. At once, they left their nets and did what? And they followed Jesus. So when you get the call, when Jesus calls you, immediately you become his disciple and you follow him. And what's your purpose of following him? To learn from him until you get to a point where you can go and start duplicating what Jesus uh, did with his disciples. Amen? Amen. So, the, so discipleship, another good word for it is reciprocating. Reciprocating the process. Be one, make one. Go ahead, go ahead. Say, neighbor, be one. Yes, yes, make one. Be one, make one, okay? Be one, make one. It's that simple in a, in a nutshell. 
in a nutshell. Here we go in a disciple. And I love this. I told you this slide was going to grow. A disciple is one who repents, confesses, bears lasting fruit, follows Jesus, denies themselves, separates from the world, picks up their cross, suffers effectively, mission-minded, meditates on the word, proclaims the gospel, discipline, controls themselves, captures every thought, advocate of righteousness, practices, humility, strives for perfection, masters sin, resists temptation, obedient, cautious of false doctrines, test every spirit, wears the whole armor of God, connected to the body of Christ, aware of the spiritual battle, prays without season, always rejoice, always thankful, makes disciples, loves Jesus, God above all, loves their neighbor, born and led by the Holy Spirit, walks by faith, exercises their gifts, forgives and forgets, testifies and witnesses, not ashamed of the gospel. I mean, in a nutshell, <laughs> in a nutshell, this is the marks of a true disciple who bears fruit that will last for eternal life. And are these marks of your discipleship journey? So we have to meditate on this. I know we probably don't have it all together, but now that we're putting it all together, now we have something to look forward to, yeah. something to look up to, something that now we can duplicate and get better in Amen. as disciples. And, and, and look, you're not alone in this discipleship making process. Why? Because the Holy Spirit now enables us to bear these fruit. fruits <laughs> that will last. Any questions so far? And I'm sure I can add to this list one who is regenerated, et cetera, et cetera. Fundamentally, a Christian is a disciple, a person who follows and emulates their life after the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and deed according to the scriptures and bears spiritual fruit. Dallas Willard says, a disciple is a learner, a student, an apprentice, a practitioner. Practitioner. Disciples, literally students of Jesus, our goal is to learn to be like him, which can only occur through a sincere imitation and devotion to the study of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Disciples must move beyond their learning, respond in obedience to the Lord's will, and remember, hey, but this scripture should be on everybody's doorframe somewhere. It should be in the back of your minds, in your hearts. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. That's it. As disciples, God has commanded us to live as Jesus did. It's really that simple. It's that simple. It's not complicated. The devil wants to make it look complicated and confusing, but it's really just mimicking the life of Jesus Christ. All right. And then I gave you guys a bonus slide like you guys needed a bonus slide after all the slides <laughs> that i given you. Right. A true disciple of Jesus Christ believes the truth, lives the truth and shares the truth. You can't have, Pastor, can I get one out of three? No, no, no. You can't have two out of three. No, you either get three out of three or get zero out of three. OK, we, we got to stop being part time Christians. We got to stop being lukewarm, okay? He doesn't call us to a part-time position. He calls us full-time. A life of following Jesus Christ, full-time, overtime, many times, overtime. I know I'm serving him overtime right now. Y'all pray for me, okay? And so now that we learn how to be a disciple, anybody learn how to be a disciple last week? Did y'all learn how to be a disciple last week? Okay, well, wonderful. Well, now, Pastor, what do I do now that I know how to be a true follower? Well, now it's your turn to go and make disciples. Praise the Lord. It just doesn't stop there. The mission reciprocates. So now it's time to actually go and put this into practice. All right? And Mark 16, 15, look, it says, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone, everyone. So let me get a sip here. Mm -hmm. So this next section now, as we go into 
what it means to go and to make. So go and make actually kind of go hand in hand. Okay, so in order to make, you have to go. And in order to go, you have to make. Okay, so they go hand in hand. They both require action. The, these are verbs here, go and make. They're action, they're verbs. That means it requires an endeavor on your behalf. It requires you to do something. Okay, not just sit on your feet. Now you gotta go and you gotta exercise what it means to be a disciple and make disciples. So we're gonna, in this section, we're gonna talk about what we're proclaiming, what we're testifying to, what we're actually gonna be speaking about. What is the gospel? What to proclaim and how to proclaim it. So you got your pen, you got your papers. All right, first lady, you need a notebook. Oh, you, you, you got plenty of paper back there? Okay, you sure? Okay, y'all got, okay, yo, she got her whole notebook back there. <laughs> Amen. God is good. Minister Vanderpool, you got a little notebook there. I don't know how you're going to work that out. Hey, 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 Elder, why don't you get the saint some real paper over here? Because this little notebook, I'm not even sure. Last time she tried to read me some notes and she was struggling trying to read off of that little notebook right there. Huh? You get some, get some long paper from the printer. From the printer. Yeah, get, get. I know. Sometimes I just can't help myself. Sometimes I, I, I got to come for the saints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Who, who else needs paper in here? Anybody else need paper? They, they trying to write on this little notebook here, knowing you're going to be lost in the sauce trying to follow back with all of this information we got. So now we're going to ask the question, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? All right. So the gospel, according to the evangelical dictionary of, the, of theology, it comes from the etymology you know, it's just a study of the word itself. It comes from the Anglo-Saxon, uh, the English Anglo-Saxon, and it means God's spell. In other words, it means God's story. So the gospel is God's story. And what is God's story about? Well, it's God's redemptive story. His story about how he redeemed his people from the very beginning of creation. So through and through, if we had to put it all in a nutshell, the Bible, the gospel is a redemptive account of how God saved this people multiple times. I mean, we see God saving and delivering his people time after time after time after time. He saved them in the Garden of Eden. He saved them during Noah's time. Okay, Noah was a preacher of righteousness and it took him, I don't know how many years to build the ark and how much, how much, how much time did they have to actually repent and be saved? You know, so again, but God saved Noah and his family and repopulated the earth and we see God's redemptive story being played out over and over and over again and reaching its climax in the Lord Jesus Christ and the work of the cross. So the gospel is God's redemptive story. In the Greek, e e evangelon or evangeliso, okay, means good tithing, good news. It's the good news about how God saved us and delivered us from our sins. And I love the acronym gospel here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's own son purchased eternal life. Gospel, gospel in a nutshell. And the first mention of the word gospel is in Matthew 4, 23. We see the first instance of the word gospel. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogue and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all matter of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. So we find Jesus very early in his ministry after he comes out of the wilderness from being tested by Satan himself, preaching the gospel in the, in the synagogue. And another great resource that I pray that you guys will put in your library bank is the Blue Letter Bible. Did they have an app? And they also have the website that you guys can go to, okay? And that becomes a really good source 
that whenever you're trying to look up what certain words mean in the original language, you can go to the Blue Letter Bible and it will give you the meaning of any word you're looking for that's in the Bible in its original language and context. So gospel, according to the Greek, means preach, means preach the gospel, means bring good tidings, okay? Declare glad tidings. It means to bring good news, to announce, to announce it, to proclaim it, okay? Used in the Old Testament of any kind of good news, of the joyful tidings, of God's kindness in particular, of the messianic blessings. In the New Testament, used especially of the glad tidings of the coming kingdom of God and of the salvation to be obtained uh, in it through Christ and of what relates to this salvation to proclaim to instruct men concerning things that pertain to christian salvation okay and the other root word for euangelon e e i can't even really say that correctly i'll probably have to come back and recorrect that pronunciation but that's an eu euangelon e okay yeah that's a tough one for me that's why i don't speak fluent greek um, but it's a reward for good tidings it's the glad tidings of the kingdom of God soon to be set up and subsequently also of Jesus, the Messiah, the founder of this kingdom, okay? After the death of Christ, the term comprises also the preaching of concerning Jesus Christ as having suffered death on the cross to procure eternal salvation for the men in the kingdom of God, but as restored to life and exalted to the right hand of God in heaven. Thence to return in majesty to consummate the kingdom of God, meaning the second coming to bring back everything to its fruition, to restore everything, to make everything new again, to bring it back full circle. Amen. The proclamation of the grace of God manifested and pledged in Christ, the gospel. So this is what the word gospel means. And notice that this is just not a New Testament concept. It, 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 it derives all the way back to the time of Isaiah. 700 BC time frame when he was predicting the Messiah to come. Okay, 700 years before he came. If you read Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering servant, it outlines the suffering of the Messiah, how he was to come in exact detail. The prophecies are so detailed, it's amazing. But Isaiah says this in 61, and Jesus quoted this same prophecy in Luke chapter 4. It says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. So the good news was announced through the prophets. And it even goes further than that. Real quick, the same thing in the Old Testament with Hebrew. It means to bear news, to bear tidings, to publish, to preach, to show forth, to announce. Again, this is the announcement that there is going to be good news, that God was going to send a deliverer to free the people from their sins. That was the hope that they had. Remember, Israel was in exile. They had oppression by the Assyrians, then they had oppression by the Babylonians, and then the Persians came back and helped them reestablish uh, the temple and stuff, but then ultimately they would be defeated again, okay? And, that, and, and it's been empire after empire until 1948, almost, what, 3,000 years? Because the monarchy was established in 1,000, what, BC? And after... Solomon, then we see civil war happening, and then the Assyrians come in and take over. So about 2,500 years, Israel would be under oppression of another regime. Not until 1948, they were finally declared a sovereign nation. After 2,500 years, think about that. How amazing is God to keep his promises, to sustain the land. They said, if you want to know that God exists, look at Israel. They still exist. They're this little nation, little nation surrounded by bigger nations that are ran by oppressive regimes that all they want to do is destroy it. Until this day, they have been unsuccessful. <laughs> God is good. God is good. There was a report that came out by the enemy himself because they were launching missiles. And this was several years ago. And the report was, man, it's like God is smacking the missiles away from Israel. 
Like we keep trying to launch attacks on it, but God continues to protect and preserve Israel. So if you want to know God exists, just look at Israel. It exists. And if Israel exists, God exists. Praise the Lord. So the gospel, the first gospel was announced in the very beginning in the book of Genesis. Did you know that? And there's a special word called for this first gospel. It's called Proto-Evangelion. Proto meaning before, meaning first, the first gospel. So when Adam and Eve sinned, God said, look, if you eat of this fruit from the forbidden fruit of knowledge of good and evil, what was going to happen? You will surely die. Okay. So instead of wiping them out immediately, God gives them this promise. He says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So it was announcing the gospel in advance of what God was going to do through his son, Jesus Christ, and how he was going to die on a cross for the salvation of his people. Amen? So the gospel was announced in the very beginning in Genesis. God was in the business of redeeming his people even after they disobeyed him. The original gospel announced in Genesis 3.15. So this gospel that's being referred to in the New Testament is not a new concept. It actually derives from the Old Testament from the very beginning. Amen. And so what elements are contained in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Here we go. We're going to break it down for you. you guys ready? Any questions so far? Any comments? Any comments online? We good to go? Thumbs up? Okay. Okay. Now I know that this is, this is all compounded here, but I just wanted to give you a brief overview. And this is a copy of what's inside the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology. And the gospel, again, it proclaims the redemptive, right up here, it proclaims the redemptive activity of God. This activity is bound up with the person and work of God's son, Christ Jesus. Thus, it is also the gospel of Christ, and this gospel is variously expressed as the gospel of our Lord Jesus, the glorious gospel of the blessed God, the gospel of his son, and the gospel of the glory of Christ. So this gospel has many uh, various uh, you know, uh, phrases attached to it, but it's all the same thing, kind of, okay? It is a gospel of salvation and peace. It proclaims the hope of eternal life. It is the word of truth. Through this gospel, life and immortality are brought to life. Okay, so what did, what did you just say, Pastor? Okay, I'm glad you asked that question. So here we go. Here we go. Okay, the elements of the gospel include the announcement of the first gospel in Genesis 3.15 and re-emphasized by the prophets in the Old Testament, like Isaiah 61.1. Okay, the elements of the gospel include the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything about Jesus is the gospel. And it also includes all four gospels, all four testaments written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? And then the bonus one here testified also by Paul and his epistles as well. It also involves the incarnation, God becoming flesh, the virgin birth, the spiritual inauguration, okay? When, when, when Jesus comes out of the wilderness, boom, he begins his ministry. It also includes all of his teachings contained in the gospel, not just a little bit. We don't pick and choose what aspect of the gospel we follow. No, it encompasses everything that speaks about Jesus Christ and the events of Jesus' crucifixion and empty tomb. These are the elements that are contained in the gospel. It also refers to his kingship. Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the Messiah. The gospel is about his authority, his God-like nature, his deity, his fulfillment, and his second coming. Jesus is going to come back again. That's part of the gospel as well. How Jesus redeemed his people which cannot be ignored. You see, we try to, churches today, not all churches, but many churches, they like to dress up the cross. They like to make it look fancy. They like to make it look attractive. 
Okay, but there's nothing attractive with how God redeemed us from our sin. It required crucifixion. It required nails. It required blood being shed on the cross. It required a crown of thorns. It required a pierce on his side. It was a very brutal death, very humiliating, all because he loved us. There's nothing attractive about how Jesus saved us from our sins. Amen? So the gospel includes how he redeemed us, the means by which he redeemed us, and that's the cross. That's the cross. And it also incorporates the charge of the Great Commission to go make disciples, proclaim, baptize, and to teach everything that the Lord commanded. All in a nutshell. All in a nutshell. Okay, what you think about that? That nutshell is probably overwhelming right now, huh? It's probably growing. It ain't a nutshell anymore. Probably a coconut now. <laughs> it's a coconut now. Awesome, awesome. So what do we got next? Okay, essentially the gospel is the good news of the life, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, promised in Genesis 3, 4, uh, 3, 15, foretold by the prophets and realized in the New Testament by the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the good news is the ushering of God's kingdom through Jesus Christ on earth that offers redemption to all who would believe in him. The gospel again, in a nutshell, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So now we kind of understand what it, what the gospel is, what it means and what it entails. All right. And if we want a verse of scripture that kind of breaks down what the gospel is in a nutshell, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8 is one of the earliest church creeds that surrounded or that circulated in the early church that gave believers an opportunity to memorize the fundamental elements of the gospel. And Paul says this, now brothers and sisters, now Christian Way Ministries, now those who are online, those that are on the Zoom conference call, I want to remind you of the gospel preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, this testimony, this good news, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, so what Paul is getting ready to disseminate, for what I received, I pass on to you as of what? First importance, and here goes the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to what? The world, no, according to the scriptures, because it was predicted and prophesied through the prophet that he was going to die for our sins. Okay, so that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, which is also known as Peter, and then to the 12 disciples. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers of the, of, uh, more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Okay, this is after he rose from the dead, after he left the tomb, after he appeared to the multitude of the 500 people at one time. There is no way you can hallucinate that. No way you can hallucinate. They tried the hallucination theory. They tried the swoon theory. Now the swoon theory says that Jesus somehow just got off the cross after being crucified and he somehow managed to survive. No, the swoon theory fails at so many levels. Why? Because the Romans were experts at death. They knew when someone was dead. Okay, this is what they did for a living. There was no way Jesus escaped off the cross except by leaving the tomb empty. Okay, and so another one of those, uh, those things is that somehow all 500 of the brothers and sisters uh, uh, hallucinated the same event. There has never been such a situation where 500 people hallucinate the same thing. So that theory fails on multiple levels. But yet the Lord appeared to 500 witnesses at the same time. And it says most of whom are still living, meaning, look, the witnesses are still alive. We can go and we can ask these witnesses who saw the Lord Jesus Christ with their own eyes. So this is I living testimony. The most powerful testimony you can have in the court of law today. If, if somebody was to get murdered and you have two or three witnesses to witness that murder, no matter what else comes to God, I have strong testimony by just these witnesses. 
So eyewitness testimony is powerful testimony. And we have 500 brothers that witnessed the Lord Jesus Christ after his death. Man, powerful testimony. Okay. And, and then it says, though some had fallen asleep, then he appeared to who? James. And who is James? James is the, the, the Lord's brother, the brother of Jesus Christ. He appeared to his own brother, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. He was on the way to persecute Christians. And the Lord interfered and intervened on that road and was blinded for three days. And became one of the one, one, one of the he became the one most responsible for half of the writings in the New Testament. He became he went from crucifying or from from persecuting Christians to being responsible for writing more than half of the New Testament. Talk about a powerful transformation all by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he testifies to this to the church. So if you want the gospel in a nutshell, in a few verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8 is where you'll find it. Amen? Amen? Awesome, awesome. Okay, and so now we preach the gospel. Mark 16, 15 says to preach the gospel to whom? To everyone. Okay, and so now we want to just break down this word preach for a second. There's this, this, this clothing brand out there called Caruso, and Caruso is the Greek for preach. And so this brand you know, uses Caruso in a way to preach the gospel through apparel. So I've got a couple of their shirts that I bought from Life Christian Bookstore or whatever. And so there's a popular brand out there that promotes faith, promotes the gospel through the Greek word Caruso. All right. And Caruso means to preach, to publish, to proclaim, okay, to be a herald, to officiate as a herald, to proclaim after the manner of a herald. So a herald is one who is responsible for proclaiming you know, the gospel in an official capacity. And then it says to proclaim after the manner of a herald. So, hey, for instance, I preach the gospel to you guys, and then you guys take what you learn and you go and you deliver it in your own particular platforms and contexts or in your jobs or whatever the case may be. You go and you put it into practice, all right? It says to publish, proclaim openly something which has been done, used of the public proclamation of the gospel and matters pertaining to it, made by John the Baptist, by Jesus, by the apostles and other Christian teachers. So if you want to change the world, it must begin and end with true disciples of Jesus Christ who go and make disciples. Again, the whole part of what I'm defending is what? Teaching intentional discipleship in an age of moral relativism. And the only way to spark change is by going and proclaiming the gospel, announcing it, publishing it, proclaiming it, speaking it. And Poruo, and Poruo was, oh yeah, Poruo. So we talked about go. So we have the five great commission essentials, go, make, proclaim, baptize, and teach. So go, two letter word, two letter word means what? To depart, go, <laughs> go. I mean, I know this is common sense and this is simple stuff, but look, if we take it down a little further, it means to go, it means to depart, it means to walk, it means to go one's way with the great commission in mind to make disciples. It means to lead over, to carry over, to transfer. Go means to pursue the journey on which one has entered, to continue on one's journey, to depart from life, to follow one that is become his adherent. Who would have ever thought that I would get all of this out of the two letter word go? To lead or order one's life, to travel, praise the Lord. So that's what it means to go. Look, Paul says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? So in order to teach intentional discipleship, God has to call disciples to go and to proclaim the good news. That's the only way. The proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only way to, infect, to effectuate the Great Commission, to bring about the Great Commission, we have to proclaim it. And in our culture, in our day and age today, 
with all the censorship that's taking place, what's the one thing that the enemy is, is, is opposing? The voice of the saints, the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the one thing he's after. And so at the day of Pentecost, 50 days after his resurrection, he told the disciples to go to the upper room so they can receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon them. And then once they receive the Holy Spirit, what were they going to be? They shall be what? Witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. We are to be his what? His witnesses, his disciples, ones who testify, okay? And so how do we proclaim the good news? How do we witness? How do we testify? That's a good question. So I know I'm giving you guys a lot of information here, but notice right up here in the very top, martyrs is the Greek word for martyrs. So do you know what a martyr is? A martyr is a witness. A witness in the Greek is a martyr, okay? And what is a martyr? A martyr is, let's see here, let's, let's see which definition we can go with here. In the historical sense, we're gonna go right here to B. In the historical sense, one who is a spectator of anything, okay? To be a witness for one, serve him by testimony. He said he is said to be a witness to whose attestation appeal is made, hence the formula, okay? And it says here, it says here, who after his example have proved the strength and genuineness of the faith in Christ by undergoing a violent death. So at times to be a witness may also require a violent death. Yes. Whoever would save their life would lose their life, but whoever would lose their life for my sake will save it. So being a witness of Jesus Christ could ultimately carry a death penalty, a death penalty that all the disciples were willing to take in the first century. They were willing to die for the faith. Why? Because they had the assurance that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and whoever would believe in him, even though they die, shall live. So they had the promise of eternal life. They understood that this life in the flesh, in the world, is not our home. Our true home is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. So being a witness for the faith, testifying to the faith, to the gospel of Jesus Christ, can at times require a death penalty from his disciples. So we can't shy away of the cost of discipleship. There is a cost, by the way. There is a cost. Grace is costly. It costs the son of our God on a cross. There's a cost to it. All right. So one way we can proclaim the gospel in our day and age today is simply to testify to it. Testify. Number one, your story God's story. Your story is God's story. The only reason why you're here today is because of God. Amen. The only reason why you made it this far today is because of God. Each one of you have a story. Each one of you have a testimony. Each one of you have a journey where God has brought you from to where you are today. And guess what? Each one of your stories is a powerful story. I could look in here right now and I could see nothing but powerful testimony after powerful testimony. And what are you doing with that testimony? It was the Lord that brought you here today. So how are you using your testimony to make disciples? How are you using that to your advantage? Look, Revelation 12, 11, the saints triumph over him, Satan, by the blood of the lamb and by what? The word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So they had the word of God and they had their testimony. And testimony in the Greek, witness, testimony, record or record, report. Okay, one that testifies before a judge. So you know how we testify before a judge? You know, we're trying to 
defend whatever it is, or we're trying to prosecute, we're trying to testify to whatever it is in a legal courtroom. Well, in the same sense, in the context of our culture in general, we are to testify to others, non-believers, believers, wherever we may find ourselves in, as one would testify in front of a judge, we are to testify in our world, in our context today. All right? Testifying. And it's an office committed to the prophets of testifying concerning future events. Okay, what one testifies before judge, as we said before. What else do we have here? I know there's a low, I'm not gonna read all of it, but there was something important here. Okay, however, explain that have the duty of testifying laid upon oneself, the testimony of Christ. All right, the testimony which he gave concerning future events. So that was the job of the Messiah. So even the, 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 the prophets, the apostles, they all had a duty to testify. The disciples had a duty to testify about what Jesus did. So we can't minimize proclaiming the gospel without testimony. You need testimony. In, in our worship service, we have testimony time, and we go from what? From test to testimony. And every one of us has a test. Well, several tests, a multitude of tests. Uh, unlimited number of tests <laughs> that we've been through in our life to get us to our testimony. Amen. So that's why we share our testimony because you never know how that may encourage our brother and sister to continue to fight the good fight for the faith. There is a testimony at the end of every test. Okay? And that's what it really means to be a witness, to testify to your testimony. To proclaim the gospel in the context of the Great Commission is simply to announce it, to testify to it, to declare it. This opportunity to witness your testimony is available, notice, to all the true disciples of Jesus Christ. And just like discipleship, the Great Commission is not optional, but mandatory, but mandatory, okay? Now, the reason why I say in the context of the Great Commission, because I'm not speaking from an official position. Okay, like a pastor or an elder or a deacon. I'm talking about proclaiming and testifying your story and the good news of Jesus Christ just going out in a general sense in the world. We're all commissioned and charged to go and announce the good news. We're all, we're all, we're all able and capable to do that. Okay. And what does it mean to testify? And what are we testifying to? We're testifying to the goodness of Jesus. How good has God been to you in your life? He's been amazing, right? He's been eternally amazing, right? So this is some of the things that we could testify about. Testify to how Jesus saved you, changed you, and helped you in your situation. That's how we can go and proclaim the good news by just simply sharing your story, which is God's story. Testify your testimony through your servitude, gifts, and platforms. So God has given us creative abilities and talents and gifts that we can use to testify our testimony through. Like for instance, the ladies had Women's Sunday this past Sunday, praise the Lord, and they did so amazing. They did so amazing, so amazing. And at times, I know we had Sister Lena and Harriet, they, they sang their songs here and then Sharon and them, they had their dance. And no, a, a number of times what happens is before they get into their song or after their song, they're testifying to the goodness of God and how they saved them because they're touched by the spirit in regards to their performance or whatever it is they did to glorify the Lord. And through that, they offer their testimony to the saints in regards to how God has been good to them. Yeah. So your testimony, you testify to your testimony through your servitude, gifts, and your platforms. You testify to who Jesus is and how he is the only person. Look at this. Jesus is the only. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, only. And what does that mean? Nobody else did this. Nobody else did this. Jesus is the only person in all of human history to do what? Die on the cross for our sin and rise from the dead. He is the only one. Only one. Only one. Look, look, it says in Romans 5, chapter uh, Romans 5, 6. It says, you see, at just the right time, while we were yet powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And then it says, very rarely will anyone die 
for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. So look, it's very rare that regular people will die for somebody for a righteous cause. That's a very rare instance that that will happen. But look at this. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were unrighteous and sinners, Christ died for us. <laughs> so this is the good news that we're testifying to that while we, while I sin, I have a good God that took my sin, my penalty on the cross. He became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is the gospel, saints. This is the good news that we need to be announcing to the world. Yeah. Are we announcing this good news, though? Mm -hmm. Are we testifying to the goodness of God, especially in our day and age today where we're growing more and more away from God? What a great opportunity to testify to the goodness of God, especially in our day and age today. True disciples of Jesus Christ testify to his lordship, not remain silent. Many of us are scared to even share that Jesus is the king of kings on our own social media timelines because we're nervous that we may lose some friends. If you lost friends because you proclaim that Jesus is the king of kings, they want your friend anyway. Amen. I done lost many friends from preaching the gospel. Every time I look at my friends list, it keeps declining. Okay, it's on a decline. But you know what? That encourages me to preach the gospel even more. God is good. And look, it could be something as simple as this. The angel at the tomb announced the greatest news there was to announce and charged the women that were present at the tomb to go tell the disciples this very piece of news. Groundbreaking. He is not here. He is risen. He is alive. He sits at the right hand throne of the Father in heaven. Our God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. He is alive. And just as he said, Jesus had predicted that he must suffer death, but that he was going to raise on the third day. He predicted his own resurrection. This is the good news. This is the gospel. Are we announcing it? Look, Jesus said before he rose that he was going to rise from the dead. And it happened just as he predicted. And it's recorded for us. We have it in the confines of 66 books, what we call a Bible today. We have the very means of the good news at the, at the touch of our fingertips. So there is power in your testimony. Okay? And there are three elements of witnessing your testimony to others. So when it comes to testifying to your testimony, it has to be first intentional. You have to step out on faith and use the very mouthpiece that the, that the Lord is giving you. He's giving you all beautiful voices. He's all giving you a multitude, a multitude of platforms and doors that he's open for you just to announce and be intentional with your testimony. So in our prayers, are we asking God, Lord, lead me to testify to your goodness and to your glory and where you brought me from to somebody today. Please, Lord, send somebody, somebody my way so I can testify to how good you are. Okay, so it must be intentional. Second, it must be incarnational, meaning the example of your life being lived out before a lost world. It must be reciprocal. You can't testify to something that you ain't living yourself. Oops, 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 oops. You can't be telling people to not use the potty mouth and you using the potty mouth yourself. First, you got to take the sawdust out of your own eye before you call somebody else's sawdust out. Okay, we can't be hypocritical. There's no such thing as a, 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 a double standard Christian, a hypocritical Christian, no. Either one or the other, you either hypocrite or you, you holy. Okay, so we, we got to live out the example in a lost world. And that example is going to lead others to the faith. They're going to want to see your joy. They're going to want to see, Amen. you know, where your spirit comes from, why you're so, uh, uh, you're smiling all the time. You know, you just have that, that, that presence, that aurora about you that is contagious. And which brings me to my third point. It must be infectious. Your testimony must be infectious. 
There must be an affectious, a passionate joy evident to those you witness to. Okay, you can't, God is good. <laughs> He's amazing. I don't know what I would do without him. I mean, there's gotta be some kind of excitement about what God has done in your life. How, how are you gonna get others excited about your testimony? You're not excited about your own testimony. I mean, come on, think about it. I'm trying to make disciples, but I'm boring in how I make disciples. Can you imagine the pastor up here? I'll try to preach the greatest news of all time. And I'm so excited about the good news, but I just, there's no inflection in my voice. You know, you've got to be infectious about it. There's got to, it's got to be contagious. You've got to be excited about it. That's the problem with many Christians today. They're not excited about their testimony. They're not excited to speak about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for our sins. We're not excited about it. It is, look, it is the greatest news the world has ever heard. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the goat. It is the goat. It is the goat of goats. It is the greatest of all time. Yes, yes. Hey, look, I'm gonna talk about how we can use the culture, okay, to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know you like that, the goat that's just peeking out there. Like. <laughs> but the gospel is the goat. It is the goat. Look, we talk about the goat all the time. I know I got some sports enthusiasts in here. You know, we talk about Michael Jordan being the goat. We talk about Muhammad Ali being the goat. Today, we talk about Steph Curry being the best three-point shooter. You know, in due time, Dak Prescott, who just signed a $166 million contract. I'm just saying, he may become one of the greatest of all times. But look, think about this. None of them died on the cross and resurrected and left the tomb empty. So, so Jesus took it to a whole nother level, a level that can never be duplicated by anybody else ever. The gospel is the greatest news. It is the goat of goats. It don't get any better in our life and in our world and in all of human history than the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the greatest news. And yet we're not even infectious about sharing it. As disciples, you have to be excited about this news. We rarely preach in the resurrection from the pulpit anymore. Without the resurrection, our faith is in vain. So if we're not excited about what Jesus did, how can we go and make disciples and exercise the Great Commission and proclaim it and publish it and testify to it and announce it? If we're not excited to share our own testimony, to share the greatest news the world has ever heard. Jesus is alive. He's alive, saints. Look, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. So we, as disciples, we have to acknowledge our faith. We have to acknowledge who Jesus Christ is. He is the King. He is the Lord. He is my God and my Savior. That's who Jesus is. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the bright morning star, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Without him, nothing that was made was made. He is the creator of the universe who came down into the flesh and dwelt among men. This is the gospel. But whoever disowns me before others, whoever does not acknowledge Jesus is the Christ, I will disown him before my father in heaven. So you can't be a disciple and a Christian and don't acknowledge your faith. Don't share your testimony. Remaining silent means you're disowning your God. Think about it. How can you be a Christian and think you're gonna inherit the kingdom and you don't even share the goodness of God? Hmm? Misconceptions. Seeds of doubt that the enemy is sowing amongst believers in our American culture. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Christians today are ashamed to announce it. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is what? The power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. 
Man, this is, man, this is one of my favorite verses of scripture right here. I, are you ashamed of the gospel? So how can you demonstrate that you're not ashamed of it? By being intentional with proclaiming it and announcing it, by being passionate about the good news of Jesus Christ. Silence is not an option. There is no such thing as a complacent Christian, as a complacent disciple. There is no such thing as a silent Christian, okay? One who just limits their testimony and never shares it. You're not a Christian, I'm sorry. A Christian is a disciple who exercises the Great Commission, who goes and makes and proclaims and announces the good news and shares their testimony. All of this goes hand in hand. Unfortunate in America, we've been fed a false gospel, a gospel that doesn't announce the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I know some of this may be a difficult teaching because it's a teaching that in America we haven't heard much of. So number two, that was just number one, how we can testify to our faith. Y'all ready for number two? <laughs> Y'all ready for number two? How can you learn a lot just by observing? Yeah, you can learn a lot just by observing. So how do we proclaim the gospel? Well, we got to observe some things in order to be effective in proclaiming it. So consider how Jesus witnessed and testified to in these various scenarios. So that's why it's so important to meditate on the word of God and not meditate on it, but actually examine how Jesus interacted with various individuals mentioned throughout the New Testament. First, Satan. How did Jesus respond to Satan in the three times that Satan attempted to tempt him? How did he respond to him? Satan responded uh, with scripture and Jesus came back and hit him with scripture in a way that the devil didn't want to tempt him no more. <laughs> it's like, hey, look, even after 40, look, and Satan always waits for the your weakest opportunity for when you are vulnerable, when you are weak, okay? And that's when he goes into attack. You see, it says that Jesus was hungry. He was thirsty. He had been fasting for 40 days. So he didn't, uh, he didn't attempt to attack him in the very beginning of his fast. He waited until he was at his weakest point. And even at Jesus' weakest point, he still hit him back with the scripture to the point where the devil resisted him and fleed from him. And he didn't test him anymore. So when it comes to these encounters and how we witness and we testify, we have to examine how Jesus dealt with the devil himself. We have to make sure we have our whole armor of God on. Before we go out and testify and announce, let's make sure we where we need to be, right? Make sure you have the whole armor of God on because the devil is prowling around like a ruined lion seeking whom he may devour, okay? And then how he witnessed and testified to his own disciples. Matthew chapter five through seven, the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon of all time. It's not by David Martinez, it's by Jesus Christ himself. The Sermon on the Mount, know it. Be familiarize yourself with it. Be intimate with it. Greatest sermon ever. And then how Jesus witnessed and testified to unbelievers. John chapter four and Luke 19. I can't go over these specific accounts. I will go over John four real quick. And this is to the Samaritan woman. Now this is a, a beautiful account because the Samaritans were considered dogs in their culture. Okay, and Jesus is found talking with the Samaritan woman and she goes back to her other fellow Samaritans after Jesus done told her because she he was like, go tell your husband about blah, blah, blah. And she says, well, I don't have I don't I don't have a, I have a husband. And then Jesus says, you're right. You have five husbands. <laughs> you have five husbands. And the one that you're living with right now, you know, that ain't your husband. So she had like five baby daddies. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't say that she had kids or anything like that. I don't know, just saying, you know, she had five husbands. But yet, look, Jesus had mercy and grace on this Samaritan woman who had five husbands before and now, in a sense, was living with a person who wasn't even her husband. And Jesus says, yeah, you were right in saying that you don't have no husband. So then the woman goes back and says in John 4, 29, come see a man 
who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the, so she was so infectious and excited about meeting this Messiah that just spoke everything about her without her even revealing it to him. So she goes back to her town, she announces, she testifies, she proclaims it. And what happens in John 4, 39? And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which what? Testified. Come on, saints. Testified. And he told me all that I ever did. So your testimony and how you announce it and proclaim the gospel and your story is very powerful and can lead others unto Jesus Christ himself. All right. One of the ways that he will lift all men to himself is by your testimony. Okay, by the announcement, by the proclamation of the gospel. So I want to go back here. So consider how Jesus witnessed and testified to Satan, to the disciples, to unbelievers, John chapter 4, Luke 19, to the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day, Matthew 23 and Luke 4, and then to the authorities, to Pontius Pilate, uh, to the high priest at the Sanhedrin, Matthew 26 and Luke 26 verse 66 through chapter 23, verse 24. And then also consider how John the Baptist testified about Jesus in John 3, 22 through 36. And I wanna read that to you. Look at John the Baptist's testimony. In John chapter 23, look how he testifies about Jesus, okay? And look in verse 27, it says to this, John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. Look at this. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater and I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the spirit without limit. The father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the son will not see life for God's wrath remains on them. So this is how John the Baptist testified to his ministry of announcing the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He testified, he announced, and he told people what he was about and what he was doing. And guess what? Many people did not accept their, his testimony. And likewise, when we go ye therefore and we go and we baptize and we proclaim, many people aren't going to accept our testimony. And we should expect that. But don't allow that to zap you from your zeal of sharing your story and sharing your testifying and to announcing the gospel. Okay? Many people are going to reject your, your message, but we must learn how to brush our shoulders off and wipe the dust off our feet and keep moving forward, okay? Knowing that our testimony will not be accepted by everybody. A disciple examines at the bottom how Jesus responded to various figures in the gospels to the glory of God. And this is just uh, uh, another another instance right here. And I believe this was this was Luke 22 with the authorities and how Jesus was responding uh, to the elders at the at the council right when he was being tried. Look, and it says at daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law met together and Jesus was led before them. And they said, if you are the Messiah, they said, tell us, Jesus answered. And then he says, if I tell you, you would not believe me. And if I ask you, you would not answer. But from now on, the son of man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. And then they all ask, are you then the son of God? So at this point, he replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. So even Jesus at a certain point 
testify to who he is, which at the end of the day was the cause of them moving forward with crucifying him on the cross. They said, we don't need to hear any more testimony. He testified out of his own lips that he is the son of the living God. Testimony, saints, even Jesus testified. And if we're going to be followers, true followers of Jesus Christ, we must also mimic his life. If he testified, we testify. Amen. Amen. Number three, and lastly, um, as I close up this course, context matters. Context matters. When it comes to how we proclaim the gospel, context matters. Amen. Discipleship matters. You know, context matters. And you see that matters thing. That's an actual cultural term that we've taken and we are using it to bring the glory of God, to testify to the goodness of God, to share the faith, to relate the gospel in a way that is understandable to the people in our day and age. And you guys know the whole Black Lives Matter thing was really ultimately what started the whole thing. Everything matters. Right. So we took it as a church. OK, Christ lives matter. The word of God matters. Okay, discipleship matters. Repetition matters. All right. So we took it and we used it in a way to announce the gospel, to share the gospel in terms that's relatable to the culture and to the context of our church today. So context matters. And what do I mean by context matters, right? I want to go here. Oh, I didn't I didn't break it down for you guys. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that I thought I broke it down. So in a sense, we have to evaluate what our context is. We have to look at our culture today. And this is the reason why we did the historical formulations. This is why we did the history and why we got to where we are today as a culture. Because if we don't understand the context, how can we yeah. minister effectively the gospel in our contemporary context? So it matters. It matters. And from scripture, let me show you how much it matters. In Acts chapter 17. OK, Paul understood the context and whom he was ministering to. And then he stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus, right, Areopagus, and said, people of Athens. So these are the Greeks. I see that in every way you are religious. For as I walk around and I look carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So he paid attention to his context. He paid attention to the culture. He paid attention that they were, in fact, a religious people, but they were worshiping a God they didn't even know the name of. And then he says, so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Huh? So he goes on and he relates the gospel message to their culture in a, in a way that they could understand. So he took something from them, and he, in a sense, redefined it and applied the gospel to it. And that's how we, in a sense, as believers, we have to understand the culture. We have to understand the context. And we have to use it to our advantage. Remember, just as the devil takes advantage of the context and culture to lead people away from God, uh-huh, disciples can take advantage of the context and culture to lead people towards the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it right there. That's it. So there are a lot of things in our culture today that are leading people away from God, but we use some of those things to lead people towards God. Like the, the saying, do you. Um, I take that all the time. No, don't do you. Do the Lord. <laughs> do the gospel. <laughs> do repentance. <laughs> okay? Okay? Deny yourself. We, we, do you do me? No. Deny your flesh. So we take the items of the culture and we redefine it to encourage believers to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in the culture today. It's not conforming to the culture. It's taking certain things from the culture and redefining it and applying it in a way that leads people towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, this is not prosperity gospel. This is not entertainment. This is just being smart with knowing how to contemporize the gospel message in a way that's effective to leading others towards salvation. And that's what it's all about. And Paul was really good at that. And we have this great example here. Um, and then look at this response. Look at his response. So after he says, look to an unknown God, and then he says, this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. 
Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he had made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being as some of your own prophets. Then he takes a look as some of your own poets. Your own Greek poets have said, we are his offspring. So he took a cultural phrase, a Greek cultural phrase, and applied it in ministering the gospel to his context and culture. But if we don't know the day and age that we live in, if we don't know the age of moral relativism, where the absolute truth of words, uh, God's word is at war with relative truth, our feelings and our emotions, how are we going to minister effectively in this culture? So we have to understand context. Context matters. Okay? I like that. Remember, just as the devil takes advantage of the context and culture to lead people away from God, disciples can take advantage of the context and culture to lead people towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of my favorite verses, 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. So as Christians, as disciples, we have to always be prepared. We have to always be prepared. And I close out with one thing that I wanted to read to you guys. And this is that, that is actually the last slide. And it comes out of the power of your witness from this book here, The Great Commission Obedience, page 199. And um, it says, It says here, um, when someone is led to faith in Christ, they are taught and challenged to immediately share that experience. So there's this training that exists in this one ministry here, okay, that when someone comes to faith in Christ, they are taught and challenged to immediately share that experience with 10 others among their friends and family. So that's the challenge with you guys today. You know, now that you learn how to be a disciple, now that you know what the Great Commission is all about, now do something as simple as share your testimony of how far God had brought you from and how he saved you from the wide road that leads to hell, okay? And then he says, why wait for months of discipleship training or years of growth to maturity to become a witness for Christ? You can become a witness for Christ as soon as he saves you. Yeah. Because that's the testimony right there. God just delivered me from addiction, from my financial struggles. I almost died and God saved me from death. Whatever that testimony is, whatever he saved you from, you can become an immediate witness. So what they do in this training is that they said, look, now that you received the Lord Jesus Christ, now go share your experience with 10 others of your family and members. You don't have to wait months of discipleship training to start witnessing the gospel and start witnessing your testimony. Then as a new convert is led through basic and is taught in a way that he can teach it to others. So, and then the other part that we'll talk about next week is that when it comes to after you proclaim the gospel and when you really want to make disciples and teach them to obey everything they commanded to connect them to the body of Christ because then the church is responsible for also contributing in that making disciple endeavor, amen? So praise the Lord, God is good, God is good. Um, that was that was 75 slides. <laughs> that was 75 slides. And I'm trying to put all this together because guess what? All of this information is so critical to our faith. It's all absolutely essential. Without it, we're not really living true lives of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not really being true followers. We need to understand everything that is composed of being a disciple and how to exercise the Great Commission. Go, make, proclaim, proclaim. Next week, we'll talk about baptize and teaching them to obey everything the Lord Jesus Christ commanded, which is part of the mission of the church, the body of Christ as a whole. So I'm really excited. And then what we're gonna do, we're gonna do a course in review. So we'll go all the way from the beginning 
um, and we'll do a small review on everything that we've learned and then we'll tie it all together and then we'll give you the charge to go ye there for. Now you have, listen, Saints, look, look, I don't want to scare you guys, but now you guys got a whole eight weeks worth of training. Okay, so now you are without excuse. Okay, you can't, you can't meet your maker. And the Lord said, hey, look, did you have eight weeks? <laughs> and you still not sharing the testimony? You still didn't do this? You still, look, judgment begins with the family of God first. Okay, so we have to remember that. We can't just use this here, let it go through one ear and let it come out the other and not put it into practice. Whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built this house on the rock. Which little pig are you? Okay. Are you the pig that built the house on the rock? Okay. I hope you're not the wolf. <laughs> hope you're not the wolf, okay? I, that's what I pray you're not because you're gonna be eating for dinner, okay? But I'm just saying, which pig are you? Which pig are you? The pig who built this house on the rock is the one who put the word of God into practice. So we get all of this training, not to just bottle it up, put it in our pocket and save it for a rainy day. No, the gospel, we live in a dying world, a world many people are going to hell okay eternity is on the line here and god wants to use your testimony okay he wants you to announce the good news of our lord and savior jesus christ to plant and to water those seeds so he can add to the increase so we have to think bigger picture that eternity is on the line if you see your brother or sister who is in sin or is, or is, is living a life of sin, you as believers and disciples have to hold each other accountable. You have to bring them back. We got to stop being afraid of losing popularity, okay, losing notoriety. We got to get rid of that. It's about Jesus. And as long as it pleases his sight, that's all we should be concerned about. Okay. Hmm. So that's what we have to do as disciples and as Christians. We need to testify to the good news. Once we learn what a disciple is, now we be one, we make one. So we reviewed the meaning of the church and its purpose. We outlined the meaning of the Great Commission and its core essentials. We emphasize go, make, proclaim, which means to witness and to testify. We reviewed the meaning of disciple and discipleship. We covered the fundamental components of how to truly be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And then we also demonstrated the meaning of the gospel, what it entails, and how to proclaim in the context of the Great Commission. That's everything that we reviewed today. Amen. God is good. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any comments? I know we went over a little bit today, but that's fine. Look, we don't train the time as the military said, we train the standard. It's not about quantitative, it's about quality. So yes, I held you a little over tonight. Forgive me. Yes, question. Uh, my question is, what does discipleship look like to you today? You have examples of that. What does discipleship look like to me today? Well, it looks like to me exactly how it's described in the gospel. That's what discipleship is. And the one thing about discipleship is that it's timeless. It's timeless, meaning it doesn't evolve. It doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So our objective and goal is to mimic the first century church to be like the church in the first century, who, by the way, gathered every single day, who was about our father's business. So discipleship to me, what it looks like today is essentially the same thing as it was during that time. Because there's nothing new under the sun. What has been will be done again, and what has been done will be done again, right? So what, what happened during that time, there's nothing new. The same things are, it's just a, a new day. That's all it is. With the same unrighteousness, the same wickedness, the same depravity and sin that exists today, it's the same as what occurred then. Matter of fact, cities were burned for sexual depravity. So Sodom and Gomorrah is a great example of that. And what we have a very sexual, perverse culture today. It's no different from what they practiced back then. It's the same thing. And it requires the same action. 
someone, a preacher of righteousness who is testifying to the goodness of God and calling people to repentance. So to answer your question, I don't know if that really answers it, but it really looks the same as it is then. Because, because when, it, when it comes to really understanding the scriptures, you have to remove yourself from out of your own context and out of your own shoes and place yourself in their shoes to really understand the magnitude of what they really meant when it came to being a true disciple, which by the way, all of them were martyred except one for the faith. And John was exiled to the island of Patmos by himself. So they were all, they all endured severe persecution. So if we really want to know what it means to witness as they witnessed then, the only way is to take yourself out of this American culture that gives you all kind of freedoms and place yourself in their shoes where they had no freedoms. I got two more questions. Yeah. It might be the same, but yeah. What happens if I'm a believer but won't tell anyone about it? Most people do not know that I am. That's, a, that's a good question. And I'll and I'll go, I'll go back to this verse here. I think it I think it's pretty simple here, you know. Um Let's see here. And I'm glad you asked that question. Again, Matthew 10, 32 through 33. Like Matthew chapter 10 is such a great chapter. One of my favorite chapters in the New Testament. Again, whoever acknowledges me before others. So if you're a Christian and you're a disciple and you don't acknowledge your faith, what's the opposite of not acknowledging it? Denying it. It, so, 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 so the opposite of acknowledging it is denying it. And whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my father in heaven. So in a sense, you will be disowned. Not everyone who says Lord is Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my father. And what is the will of God? <laughs> to keep his commandments, to be his disciple to be sanctified through and through. Yeah. So, so again, you can't be a Christian and not acknowledge the faith. That, that's just, that's not what it was understood to be in the first century context. I know in America today, there's optional Christianity. So you can be a Christian and you don't have to testify to the faith. You don't have to participate in the discipleship. You don't have to exercise your part in the Great Commission. Everything is optional. That's the American gospel. That is a false gospel. That is not the gospel that was intended by the disciples and the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So we have to understand the gospel and what disciple really means in its first century context. Yes, ma'am. And then we'll go back to you, brother. I know you have one more question. Yeah, yeah. On that right there. Yeah. Yes. Nobody, everybody's against you. It just feels like everybody's, you know, against the spirit of God. And that's yeah. your opportunity to preach it even more. Like yes. that is when you know, okay, God has put me out of the test. Am I going to worry about popularity with my friends that if you say something, I can't come up to That's a good deal with God. And, and I hope, you know, you know that and you recognize that spiritual warfare going on. Right. So, right. You know, do the right thing and acknowledge Him. Absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes God will place you in a situation, a dark situation where there's not much light at all, where you might be surrounded with a bunch of unbelievers. Huh? The spirit of the Antichrist is over all around you. And so now it becomes important. God, I know you have me here for a reason. And there's only really one reason why he has you in such a situation to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to be a light in the dark, to be the salt in places where there's no salt, okay? So it's important to be a, a, a lamp on a hill. So so I know my, my, my wife, she had a serious situation going on with her context, you know, and over and over I ministered to her, like there's a reason why the Lord has you here. And until we pass the test, until we understand why God has us in these situations, he'll keep us there until we pass the test and we understand the purpose that God has us here. So God, why do you have me here? And reveal to me, who do you want me to share? 
and testify my testimony too, because I'm not gonna leave here until your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. There is a purpose and we gotta start thinking bigger picture. Many of us are tunnel vision, tunnel vision. We can't see out of our own tunnel. We gotta think bigger picture. Why does God have me here? What is his will? What is his purpose? Who does he want me to be a light to, okay? Our purpose, our sole purpose in life is to serve God, that's it and to testify to his glory. That's it, okay? Everything else is secondary. Most important is serving our Lord and testifying to his goodness and sharing where God has brought you from. It's reciprocal, yes. You know, Jesus called out. Oh, da, 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 you mean Mike, saying we got viewers online. Yes, yes. You know, Jesus called out people. Yes, he did. It's just like when I go on the gym, you know, I said, you know, being here with a sign of little papers and stuff, I said, God, and I said, he was talking about age. I said, oh, Lord, you know, I don't even want to discuss that. He, and the young man said, every age is a blessing. Every day you're older, you're a blessing. I said, oh, yeah. Yeah. ooh, I said, that's the door right there. Uh -huh. and, and so we have to keep our eyes open, keep yes. our ears open to little comments like that. Or if God puts you in a situation, don't care where you are, you yeah. have to you have to have that that thought of mind and say, hey, it's reason why I'm here today, right? Somebody in here is gonna get the word, right? You know, and just like and just like I was telling some of the, some of the other sisters that they had problems on their job, because I had problems on my job. I had I had this one lady who was she was a whole bunch of stuff, witchcraft and all that stuff, and she would try to sabotage. And she's my boss. That's what makes me so mad. Yeah. She tried to sabotage me. She did everything she could to, to come at me, and so and everybody in the shop knew that she didn't like me because even the customers were telling me that she didn't like me. And so it came to the point, I said, God, I said, why am I here? Because he wouldn't let me leave. Every time I tried to leave, he wouldn't let me leave. And I was like, why am I here? God? You know, I can, I can go anywhere. And, and then he, he realized, I had to realize that there was a reason why I was there. It was somebody in my shop I had to witness to. Yeah. And he wouldn't allow me to leave until I witnessed to that person. And he yeah. didn't reveal who it was. And so as time went on, I said, well, God, I said, is it her? Then let me go ahead and do that real quick. Let me not. And then it wasn't until it wasn't until I mean it was I spent three years there, yeah. and it wasn't until the last month that I was talking to one of the girls. We were talking to my nephew, and uh, we got to talking, and I said, "Oh my God!" You know, I witnessed to her, and she accepted Jesus Christ in her life, and then she had called she had called me back that Sunday. She said, "I just want to tell you that I gave my life to the Lord," and she said, "Because she was cussing around me," and I, and I told her, "I said, well, you don't got to respect me, but respect the God in me." And she said, when they, when somebody was cussing around me, she said, I told them what you told me. You know, don't respect, you got to respect me, but respect the God in me. Mm -hmm. And I said, you mean to tell me I've been here three years and you yeah. was the person all the time. Where'd you go? Yeah. You right after that, I was, I, the, matter of fact, I think it was like that same week, God had opened the door and I was able to leave that shop and go into another shop. They had a 30 day vacation. Yeah. I mean, it was awesome. So, so, so I would like to make a comment on that because God is a, a, a bigger picture God. Mm -hmm. And it's like a chess game in a sense. And he moves the pieces yes. in advance. He sets it up in advance. Yes. And sometimes he won't reveal to us the reason why we're in a certain place until the time gets to where it, it where where it needs to be and you're positioned exactly so he has to move you in advance at times because he knows what's going to come and here we are and that's why the, the scripture says be still and know that i am god be quick to hear slow to speak and slow to slow to anger so sometimes we have to be, be quick to listen to certain things because that could be a cue and a door to minister your testimony or minister the gospel so god is like he's the master chess player and he positions his pawns and his pieces where he needs them for the right time and that's exactly what he did with you you had to be there for three years because but look at this look how amazing god is and this is the gospel he will leave the 99 he will cause you to be in one place for three years Yes. just to get that one lost soul amen but that's what god did with us he did that with each and every one of us okay he made sure that he provided witnesses and and others to minister the gospel to us when we were on the wide road he left the 99 just to get us so god is good it's reciprocal and now we must do the same thing thank you yes leo yeah, I just wanted to say that honestly, it it ain't as hard as you think to to the discipleship thing ain't as hard as you know in your mind because the people that you know 
path that I was on, yeah. you know, now I start seeing them, you know, oh, so I ain't mean to crush around. I know you've been acting, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So it's like leading yeah. by example without yeah. even having to promote really hard, yeah. you know, and I can see it. And then somebody else say, oh, I think, I think me and my girl might start going to church. And I'm thinking to myself, bro, you ain't never taught. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you never watching me. Right. You're seeing, it, you're seeing God in me now. Right, right. Oh, so for the people, like, yeah. I'm trying to shine for God, not shine yeah. for me. You know right. What I'm saying? And, and just by living by example. Yeah. And, and people see that. And it's like God is already spreading it out there. Yeah. And I'm seeing people that you know, you know, people Absolutely. like doing things like they on the phone with me and they, and they, they saying, you know, flipping instead of, you know, and they just they use know, it. They, they clean up their act on yeah. the phone. <laughs> like, you talk like this, but I'm talking like this, you know, yeah. so like you said, he, he uses us, you know yeah. what I mean, to spread it out there. Yeah, so. Absolutely. I, I mean, I mean, and me and Deacon Ellie talked about this early, you know, I, I love your, 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 your G code, because I got that, that G code shirt, you know, living by, you know, God's code. And we talked about it this morning, you know, it's not about following me and what I'm teaching you guys. It's about following the Christ through me. Amen. You know, as Paul said in Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Amen. So as you continue to live your life as disciples, holy and pleasing unto God's sight, then people that have an influence or are in your inner circle are going to look at your life and the next thing you know, they're calling you. And I, I get you all the time. I get around people and I, I got some people that are just not shy at all. They'll just continue to cuss up a storm. Like they don't have no, uh, no shame in their game. But then I'll have others that they'll immediately apologize after they just, oh, my, my bad, I meant this or I meant that. But they try to clean up their stuff. And you'll see that your influence and your spirit and your fruits will cause others to change their own life. Because what happens is your light and your salt will convict the sin in their own heart. And next thing you know, the door to minister to them becomes available. So sometimes you just gotta walk the walk and 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 let it come to you, let the game come to you. Yeah. You know, a lot of this consistency, being consistent, I remember way back yeah. as a young Christian, I was in the military. And one of the first things I did, I got excited about God and talking about God. About God. So the first thing that I did to help me out was carry my Bible everywhere I went. In the military, it's like, carry my Bible everywhere. They saw me with my Bible on all the yeah. time. And that was a that was a shoe right there. They're like, you carry that Bible. <laughs> that was an open book right there. So I talked about the word and things of that nature. And I think now a lot of it was because of, you know I didn't really have the word out on the inside. You know what I'm saying? But now that I got the word on the inside, I don't necessarily need to be carrying the Bible for it to come out. You know what I'm saying? But but a lot of times people will look to you and that consistency you that you show that 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 gains that respect because they see that you that, hey, you were you, you got saved like initially I wasn't saved I was running with them so in order to, to for them to see there was a change in me that change was carrying the Bible that change was going to church that change was not going out hanging out with them and then when they asked me about it I was able to deliver God's word. A amen, amen. Well, uh, we and we thank God for your testimony because they've been in the ministry practically as long as I've been alive. So we got great examples of the faith right here at Christian Way that we're really excited to have, you know? So I, I bless Elder Elder's been doing this since I was like this. <laughs> All right, so I, I bless God, but, but thank God for the elders, those who have been living their life according to their faith in Jesus Christ and are leading other young individuals like myself and others here in the ministry and throughout their life, being a testimony to others. You know, following Christ and them following their example. So that's what it's all about. Think about it. Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Reciprocal. It's reciprocal. You follow Christ, okay? And others are going to follow your example in Christ. That's why Christians can't be hypocritical. We can't be living double standard lives because now we're being a false testimony to Christ when we don't live according to the faith. So that's why we got to be aware of those misconceptions that exist in our current culture today because we don't want to be a false testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we've been exposing all of these isms because there are a lot of false doctrines, a lot of false prophets, a lot of false Christ, a lot of false philosophies that exist in our culture today. And many of us don't even know it. 
Hmm? Many of us have subscribed to the things of the world and don't even know it. But we hold up against the able to do too far. That's right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And he's able. And, and he's able. He's able how? By sending pastors, evangelists, prophets, teachers to equip the body of Christ for works of service. Okay, so that it can be built up and we can all reach the unity of the faith and attain the whole measure and the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ and achieve maturity. I'm paraphrasing Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, but he's able by doing, by preserving his word, by sending his Holy Spirit, by giving us his son as the ultimate example. I mean, he's done so much for us. So he's able to keep us by what he's already provided and what he continues to provide. Amen. Amen. Any other comments? Yes, microphone saying. Any, any comments online? Any comments online? I know it's almost, almost time here. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but we can't be crafty and conniving <laughs> like the devil so himself. The devil but we can we can be creative in a way that would advance the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. I mean, look, Galatians six one says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. So as believers, as disciples, as Christians, if we see our brother and sister having a potty mouth, hey, I tell my children all the time, certain certain English uh, whole, words that are that are spoken that are not like cuss words or whatever, they'll say like, for instance, freaking. Uh, no, uh, there are you, you kids are smart and you are intelligent and there are other adjectives that you can use that's available in the English dictionary outside of these words here. So I, I, I hold them to account and I challenge them to use better words. And, uh, and our brothers and sisters who are out there saying that they're Christian, especially those that are Christians and disciples, but yet using words that are unholy. Hey brother, you're a Christian? How you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Then why are you talking like that? Huh? The Bible says in Ephesians 4.29, look what it says here. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their need that it may benefit those who listen. So believers cannot be trash talkers. They cannot use potty words, words that don't glorify God and bring disdain to his name. Coarse joking, unholy joking, you know, we want to have fun, but it's got to be in a way that's holy and honorable. Okay? So that's, that's what the yeah. Yeah. It's a matter of just, just telling somebody they should be cussing. Yeah. But our discipleship, the further push is to push them and invite them to church. Yeah. Because the word is a, the word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my pathway. Until they get into the word and see themselves, they can't, they can't change. Yeah. So with that word, once they see that word, once that, once that word is in their spirit, once that word is in their eyesight, then they can change and realize that, hey, the, the cursing is not, you know, my mouth shouldn't be a double mouth with yeah. foul water and fresh yeah. water coming out. Yeah. They won't know that by the word. You necessarily ain't going to get that from just witnessing somebody. So you got to take that extra step in getting them in church. church. Yeah. Be consistent, living that consistent life. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, we, huh? What is gal? What would you consider gal? He had no deceit in his mouth. Is that gal? Is that what yeah, I think that's the other term that's used in the English contemporary translation or the modern translation. There was no deceit found on his tongue, meaning there was no lie 
There was nothing about Jesus that was deceitful in his nature, in his being. No lie came. Jesus is the absolute epitome of truth and righteousness. There was no unrighteous thing about Jesus. There was no deceit on his tongue, no filthy language, no coerced joking, none of that. He was holy in every way of his life. And he conducted himself as such, even in the midst of temptation and trial, Jesus still responded in a holy way. So that's what Jesus was saying. Huh? Well, but he did respond at some point too. He, he did respond. He remained silent when he needed to remain silent and he spoke when he needed to speak. Yeah, but even on the midst, think about this, even on the midst of the cross, what was Jesus doing? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. So he's still asking the Father to forgive them while dangling on the cross near death. And then he commands us to be holy as our father in heaven is holy. That's deep stuff. You know, there's a cost to discipleship. And then that cost involves how we respond in the midst of our trials and circumstances. Yeah. Are we truly living the life of the disciple, even in the midst of extreme suffering? Yeah, it's easier said than done. The voice of the martyrs was a great example of, you know, extreme suffering. And they were, they were transparent with how they suffered. They were like, look, it was not easy at all. But we had to continue to keep our faith in God. And eventually we saw God moving and we eventually started to respond the right way. You know, so we won't always get it right. But when God convicts our hearts of where we fail, then we repent and we ask God to forgive us and he remembers our sin no more. So repentance becomes really important as disciples. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, when it comes to extreme suffering without God and his Holy Spirit and without knowing his word, it becomes very difficult to endure that extreme suffering for sure. Any other questions before we close out? Because it's already nine o'clock. I thank you guys for your patience this evening. I know we ran over a little bit, but it's just the nature of the course itself and making sure that you guys get all of this good information. So without further ado, let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for your love. We thank you for another day that you have made. We thank you for this course. We thank you for just breaking it down to us on a common level, Lord, of what the disciples and what your son Jesus Christ meant when it comes to being disciples and when it comes to exercising the Great Commission. So God, we thank you for this key understanding of our faith. We thank you, Lord, that you expose and you reveal the false doctrines and how the enemy is out to seek, kill, and destroy in our culture today. So God, we thank you, Lord, that we can test every spirit by your spirit and that anything that does not proclaim or profess that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is not of you, but is actually the spirit of the Antichrist. So God, just help us to keep an eye out on these things that our battle is, is, is truly spiritual. So help us to walk by faith and not by sight. Help us to put into practice all of the teachings that we have uh, received in this course, Lord. I know it was a lot of information, but information, Lord, that we need uh, today and especially in our day and age. So God, I pray for each and every <clears throat> that has been able to participate online and in person, I pray, Lord, that you will enable them to hear and to put into practice and to be true followers. And Lord, to proclaim and to share their testimony, to start off by just sharing it with just immediate family members so they can become accustomed to what it's like to share in their, their testimony and then to go out beyond their immediate family and go into their jobs, into their immediate context, to their schools, wherever you may lead them to share their testimony with those that you bring across their path. So God, help us to understand that discipleship is reciprocal, Lord. We love you. We thank you. And Lord, most importantly, forgive us of our sins. Continue to convict our hearts and enable us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We love you so much and we thank you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.